take you through definitions of war and conflict. Now we'll take you through uh, some definitions of the system and how we seek to administer it, how we seek to understand waging war within the context of everything else. I'm going to give you a classic rural Dutch shell methodology, two questions, four outcomes. What happens to globalization four, as I define it, 2002 and counting? The first question, the what question, how do we define the nature of the struggle? Is it the best versus the rest, or the West versus the rest? Basic breakdown of arguments. Tom Friedman, Lexus and the Olive Tree, up on top. Sam Huntington, Clash of Civilizations, down below. Tom Barnett, number 28 on Amazon. <laughs> Pentagon's new map, up on top. Robert Kaplan, anything he's ever written, down below. <laughs> Robert Kaplan went to West Africa and saw the future of the world. I said, mm, it's West Africa. Then he went to Los Angeles, got even more scared, wrote another book. How this comes about, I talked about that rule set misalignment that develops across the 90s. Does that persist? Are we always chasing to catch up with technology and economics in terms of the political and security rule sets? Or do we actually normalize? We catch up, everything's back in sync for some period of time. Four possible outcomes. Worst case scenario, a division by culture, this character flaw in the system remains. Call that one, globalization traumatized. Can you imagine? The old core turns on itself. Europeans are from Venus, Americans are from Mars. The gap only grows. Real Robert Kaplan territory. A division by culture, but new rules emerge. At least they're recognized by the old core. Japan, Europe, the United States. The danger is, new cores arise. So when I see the group of 20 plus in the World Trade Organization negotiations as an intermediary between the old core of Europe and the United States and Japan and those negotiations with the gap, and I see that that group of 20 plus that staged the walkout at Cancun is India, Brazil, China, all the countries I define as the new core, I get worried about that. I get worried about the fact that we have absolutely no new core powers in the occupation force in Iraq now. Better outcomes, a division by competency, but we don't deal with this character flaw. This is the knee-jerk reaction. Let's put a fence around these crazy people and let them kill each other. We'll move on to hydrogen. What would Jesus drive? Problem is, gap strikes back on a regular basis in that phenomenon, in that scenario. You can't retreat from the world and expect the rest of the world to work out. They will export their pain and their anger in your direction on a regular basis. Best case outcome, a division by competency, new rules emerge. Call this one globalization normalized. The core, both old and new, master 9-11s, which they're going to keep trying until you demonstrate it will have no impact. It will not drive you out of the Middle East. And you shrink the gap progressively. Meaning you take down bad actors militarily, and the real integration comes to the private sector. Government, tiny role. Four elements I put together. I think I lost my sound. I'll confess, I'm an economic determinist. I'll say technology is the main driver of history. If globalization continues to advance, all these good things will happen. You can attach numbers to most of these in terms of per capita income. Get them above a certain level, and they stop doing a lot of these bad things, start moving in the direction of these positive things. But I'll argue we have to manage carefully four crucial flows within globalization four. Those four crucial flows, meaning resources in regions where they are plentiful, have to migrate to regions where they are in scarce supply. The movement of people is a key flow. The movement of energy is a key flow. 
the movement of money, long-term, foreign direct investments, not flows in and out of stock markets, not commercial bank loans, foreign direct investment, equity ownership. And finally, the exporting of security, which only the United States can really do in any appreciable manner. Look at migrations first. Focus on populations. This is a population growth curve. There are some numbers in billions. Here's some history. This is where we've gone. When people want to scare the hell out of you, this is what they show you. We'll all be eating Soylent Green. These are the other scenarios. This is the best bet right now. Demogra demographers are focusing on this scenario. What's interesting about this scenario is you get to 2050, I'll be 88 years old, starting the second half of my life. You will see us peak as a global population. Absolute turning point in human history. After that point, we begin to depopulate as a species. Great article, not too long ago. Oh, New York Times, Sunday. China, the most populous country, facing a population shortage. They're going to age more rapidly than any country in human history, meaning they're more likely to get old before they get rich. Why is this important to us? Six billion now. This is the spread. We love these guys because they work. We've got more going in than coming out on this equation. Very important. This makes perfect sense mathematically if you think about it. We're going to have an equaling of young versus old in 2050. And from that point on, the old are going to outnumber the young. Absolutely amazing. Shouldn't happen in nature. The wolves should hunt us down, kill us in large enough numbers. By extension, why this matters to all of us. I like to say, I should be worrying about my PSR. I tend to worry about my PSA, but I should be worrying about my PSR. <laughs> why? Because I'm only 41 and I can still do something about it. Or let me say, my wife can still do something about it. PSR is potential support ratio. Every working person for everybody in retirement. This is global history. 1950, the number was 12 to 1. Still pretty rural and agrarian. With globalization, 2, it gets you down to 9 to 1. Why? Most of the world hadn't joined globalization until very near the end of the process of the century. This is what happens when you get an old and new core coming together and two-thirds of humanity are deeply integrating in a global economy. That number comes down over the next five decades very dramatically. Now, a lot of assumptions in here. Major urbanization. Huge upticks in technological productivity. People living longer, working longer. But you ask yourself, how are you going to manage that global PSR of 4 to 1 in 2050? What can come along, knock that baby off its pedestal? What can come along is a fix already in the works. We can track it. We can predict it with great accuracy. You distinguish between the old core, the new core, and the gap. PSRs across these three groups, dramatically different. Two to one in the old core, five to one in the new core, still 10 to one here. Above replacement rate here in the 50th poorest countries in 2050. So no great mystery. You've got to get people to move from the right to the left, not just into the old core, but frankly into the new core too. And you're going to have to see a lot of jobs move in this direction. the politically sensitive issue of outsourcing. Third alternative, very interesting one, a global commute. My favorite example, covered in Wired magazine last year, the Philippines. One-tenth of its working age population works overseas. And the government encourages this. They give them special holidays, free medical care, special communications, special rates on travel. What does it sound like? It sounds like how we get the US military to be the largest global commuting force on the planet. Why is that no surprise? The Filipinos learned it from us, the original stewards on the uh, ships. Right now, they have 2 million workers in the United States. Annual basis, they take out $3 billion. Quadruple that number, get the actual impact on the Filipino economy, multiplier effect. What Hispanics or Latin Americans send back to Latin America is six times what the Corps gives it in foreign aid. 
And that's keeping 95% of the money they earn here, here. They only send 5% back. And it's six times the aid the Corps sends to Latin America. This is enormously important. And again, all the things they use in the system to make this happen are the things that we're putting under attack after 9-11. The ability to travel freely. The ability to communicate freely. The ability to move money as freely as possible. 